Hey everybody, my name is uh, Dan Schindler. Uh, I'm here today with this beautiful Atom A500. Uh, before we get into it, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the history of the Atom. Uh, the Atom was actually designed by Burt Rutan, which I'm a huge fan of Burt. I have, over the years, I've owned a Very Easy. That was one of my first canard designs. I uh, sold the Very Easy and actually got a Cozy 3, which was a derivative of a basically a Long Easy. And then I uh, got into a Defiant, which is another push-pull, similar to the Atom. And then the Atom A500 came across my lap, and uh, actually on a random story, I was just looking through controller one night, and it was listed on controller, and I found it and fell in love with it. And so here we are today. Uh, the Atom was actually the very first Atom prototype flew in 2002. It uh, was developed after, um, I'm sorry, the first prototype was actually flown in the year 2000. It was called the M309 or the uh, arrow, the carbon arrow. And so Burt Rutan designed that. And as soon as I saw this airplane, I was like, man, I got to add another uh, Burt design to my fleet. And so here we are. Uh, we'll start right here at the front. The Really, the airplane itself is all uh, carbon fiber. I mean, it's, it's built like a brick house. You could actually probably hit this with a sledgehammer. In fact, if you uh, want to, we have a fuselage in the back. We could hit it with a sledgehammer and show you all what it's all, what we got. So it's, it is just solid, solid as a rock. Um, y there's been a lot of press on the build of the Atom. And, and in the press, they talked about how the FAA was giving them a really hard time about the design. And the airplane was actually overbuilt. Uh, in the excess of about 1,200 pounds heavier than the original engineers thought it would be. And so there's been, there was a lot of bad press on gross weight and uh, you know takeoff with being over gross weight and things like that. So this airplane is actually empty weight is just a little bit over 5,500 pounds. Uh, max gross takeoff weight is about 7,000 pounds. And so you can kind of you can kind of do the math there and see that there's not a lot of room in there. So we you know we fly around with half tanks and things quite a bit. So anyway, uh, the engine is a Continental uh, TSIO 550-E. It's I think the E designator is actually specifically for the Atom. I haven't really seen an E on any other airplane. It's 350 horsepower at uh, 38 and a half inches of manifold pressure, 2700 RPMs. Uh, you can fly that for five minutes and then we typically pull the power back to uh, 35 inches of manifold and 25 inch or 2500 RPM on the prop. So, and then I like to cruise uh, typically around 31 inches of manifold pressure and then pretty much whatever prop sitting you're comfortable with. We, can, we usually bring it down to like 2400 RPM on the prop uh, just for more cabin comfort. The push-pull design, it has a different harmonic uh, for those that have maybe flown a Skymaster or things like that. The harmonics between push-pull, uh, typically when I bring a new passenger in there, they'll, they'll, they'll ask like, hey, does this act like a conventional twin because I can hear a little bit of a different harmonic than normal? And the answer to that question is no. There is, there is a, a slight vibration that you get in a push-pull. Uh, my Defiant does it, this does it. I haven't flown a Skymaster in years, but uh, I've heard that they do kind of the similar thing, but we th think it's just a harmonic between the front and the, the rear engine. So. Coming around the front here, it's got a uh, Hartzell propeller. I, I believe these were actually designed for Atom. Uh, they're similar to a Cirrus. Really everything firewall forward is very similar to a Cirrus with some adjustments and changes that they made to adapt to the Atom. As you can see, and I think you might have got a shot in there, but the beautiful carbon fiber work that they did, uh, really putting this thing together, they just did an amazing job with their, with their work. Uh, coming around here, I guess we could talk about the, the landing gear. The thing with the landing gear is, is that the, the landing gear was all specifically designed by Adam for this airplane. It's not taken off of any other airplane. It was uh, specifically designed for the airplane. It is uh, electric hydraulic. The, uh, the service stability of them is pretty much the same as any other landing gear. I just actually had this nose gear serviced here about six months ago and it's really just pull it apart, put some O-rings in it and uh, put it back together. The uh, tire pressure on the front is pretty standard, 45 PSI. Uh, nothing, nothing real different there from any other airplane. The cowling does have an interesting way. If you look right here along all the bottom here, there's all these screws and that's actually how the bottom of the cowling is attached. 
underneath here, there's actually a very light sheet metal. It's like super, super thin. And just bringing these screws together into that, and there's just little nut plates under there that actually brings a lot of rigidity to it. I was actually very surprised the first time we took this cowling off uh, to see how flimsy that metal was under there. It was just like a piece of paper. But then when you bolt it all together, it's just rock solid. Uh, something kind of interesting too about these, uh, the screws that hold the cowling in play, that was something that Adam did. I don't really even understand why they did it, but um, these right here are very difficult to find. They're actually military grade. I actually had to go to a military uh, surplus store to find those. These are just these single screws themselves, and this was a few years ago, so the price has probably gone up, but they're about $75 a piece. For those little things so you know anytime we do an annual or anything like that we're constantly telling the mechanics like make sure you don't lose these and there's actually supposed to be a little retention clip on the back side of those that holds them in place but when you go to take the cowling off most of those because it's just a fine almost like safety wire most of those retention clips have you know gone missing or whatever so when i buy the new sets i don't even bother trying to put the clips on we just screw them in and as we're taking them off bag them up so the aircraft is a 28 volt airplane. This is your external power source. Um, I've never actually done a, a start with that. So I'm not even really sure how the procedure works because the batteries are always good. So uh, it has just the really big batteries inside of here. We typically will take the cowling off and just put battery minders or whatever on there if we're gonna have long periods of time between flights, but typically does really good. Um, the engine on the front, I guess I could talk about this a little bit. We just had to have this engine overhauled. This, this airplane only has uh, 500 hours on the total, total time. Uh, but when I got the airplane, it was sitting on the ramp and it had been sitting outside for a long time. And so when we purchased the airplane, I actually had to do an overhaul on the rear engine because it was ate up with corrosion. And then the front engine, they said, you know, you should be fine. Well, we got another 250 hours out of the front engine and then it failed. So. We ended up doing a complete firewall forward overhaul here. Uh, well, it just really got done in the last six months. We were delayed for an entire year because of the supply chain issues with the uh, Continental and the cranks. And so really it just gave us the opportunity, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, we decided that since the engine was off and up in Colorado for overhaul, that we would go ahead and do new avionics on the inside. So we removed all of the Avidon stuff and put all new Garmin in there. So we'll, we'll show you guys that here in a little bit when we get inside the airplane. So anyway, Again, typical Continental, uh, I'm not sure if there's, I mean, really anything else to say. It's twin turbo Continental TSI 0550, so. Coming down the fuselage, um, the windows are all seated in. They actually, when we took the uh, avionics out, we decided to check all of the windows just to make sure that they were seated and sealed right. And sure enough, they actually just have these little tabs. Believe it or not, there's just um, a little like a one inch tab with a quarter inch with a little tiny jap nut on there. And it's just little tabs that hold those windows in. And so just to kind of check them, we took those, those little tabs all the way out. And when we did, the windows just fell right out. We were like, how is this thing even pressurizing? So <laughs> we ended up uh, resealing the windows with the proper window seal and then seating them back in. So the windows definitely aren't gonna move now. So, uh, but we did have all the windows out of it, the emergency exit. The emergency exit, so when they, when they did the carbon molds on these, I don't know if they just didn't quite get it figured out or what, but these, these don't seat real well in there. In fact, you can kind of see some lips around there. And uh, it's just really just a manufacturing flaw of, it's just not kind of level with the fuselage, which somebody like me with OCD, I look at that and I'm like, oh, why didn't they do a better job on that? But it is what it is. Uh, we didn't really talk about it, but this is one of three airplanes that are flying through three of the A500s. There is one up on the Pennsylvania area and then another group that has one down in Florida. And so um, I'm super honored to even own this airplane. So it's really cool. People ask me all the time, like, what am I doing, gonna do for parts and things like that? Uh, we got really lucky because when we bought this airplane, it actually came with a ton of parts. So if you can kind of scan, that's a mess over there, but that whole top shelf and the bottom shelves, 
and then some stuff up there. You can kind of see an extra door up there. There's some spinners. We've got all kinds of cowling, and then we've got tubs full of just miscellaneous electronic parts and things like that that came with the airplane. And then they gave us a spare fuselage of one that had run off the end of the runway. And so that, the fuselage is basically stripped right now. It's, there's nothing in there. We, we went through there and stripped it all out. So now we just use it for whatever, I guess. All right, coming underneath the airplane. Again, it's all carbon fiber, so it's all sealed. You can see these uh, metal plates there on there just to protect the carbon fiber from the heat of the exhaust. Uh, I don't know if I can even begin to name all the different antennas, but uh, they're, you know, they all serve their purpose. Down here, underneath, um, I don't know if you can get underneath here with me, but this, this entire piece from, really from these flaps, all the way around this whole bottom of the belly falls or you know you can take it completely off and really most of your service for uh, your bell cranks for your ailerons your fuel system all that is directly underneath this cover in fact on this side over here you have the fuel pump for the rear engine and then on this side you, you have the fuel pump for the front engine uh, and then right here is is the actual uh, exit ports for the um, blow-off for the pressurization system. So you have your two, I guess, pop-off valves, you call them. When they, whenever they blow off, they'll come out right here. So the uh, fuel pump was recently replaced. Uh, kind of an interesting thing we had to do when we were doing a bunch of service to it. We actually, when we did the avionics, we had to drain the tanks. Well, we were having problems getting the fuel to come out of this tank right here, and so we ended up just running the fuel pump and then pumping it out the back. Well, what we didn't bother reading on the label was like, hey, don't, draw, don't run this pump for long periods of time. <laughs> so we ended up burning the pump up and had to put a new one in there. And again, you know, it's, a, it's back to that parts question. A lot of people ask me, you know, like, well, what do you do for parts? Most of the parts on this airplane outside of the airframe are off the shelf parts. When you go like try to find a fuel pump, you know, it may be an alternate part number, but it's actually an FAA approved alternate part number. And so we haven't had a lot of problems what, you know, where we're going to get into problems if we start, you know, if we bent up a landing gear or we had something that was specific to the airframe. And thankfully, since it's carbon fiber, if there's any kind of issues with carbon fiber, most of that's just repairable. So anyway, I'll scooch out here real quick. I guess since we're down here, we can talk about the main landing gear. Again, the landing gear is completely designed 100% by Adam. It has its own label up here that um, you know their engineers put together. It's trailing link landing gear, so it's near impossible to do a bad landing. And now that I say that, I'll probably do that later, right? <laughs> so uh, it, again, it's electric hydraulic. Um, on, on one side of the boom, when we get to the other side, they, they actually, the hydraulic pump is actually in the tail boom, uh, and there's a way to look at, you know, to make sure it has enough fluid and things like that. The uh, front, uh, right here, you have a uh, landing light and you have a uh, taxi light, one on either side. And I, I don't remember which side is which, but that's where, you know, you basically, it's really cool when it's coming in at night because you have, you know, the lights are out here and it's coming in. It looks really super cool. All right, coming in here, obviously this is our exit area. If you were to have to come out the emergency exit for some reason, you have that. Um, you have, I'm drawing a blank what these things are even called. Maybe somebody can help us on this. These are kind of a, a style of VG, but I think they have a specific name for them. So, uh, when they, when they designed this airplane, I, I, I've talked to a bunch of the Adam guys and one of the pilots, and he's like, this is probably the dirtiest wing ever made. And so from what they tell me, they were trying to engineer a really sleek wing, and then they'd go out and do test flights and discover airflow wasn't right or there wasn't something right. And so they would add these, and then they come out here, and then they ended up adding the, the leading edge cuff and then the VGs. And then if you look underneath, there's actually VGs in front of the aileron to help recapture the air back to the ailerons. And so he, he laughs because he says, you know, this is probably one of the dirtiest, ugliest wings he's ever seen, but I think it's the most, I mean, this airplane flies so beautiful, whatever they did. Like I was coming into here, we're at Redbird and 
everybody in the pattern, like all the way in, I think I was coming out of Houston or something, but everybody there was like, we're getting, you know, the Cirrus pilots and the, even the jet pilots, they were like, we're getting beat up, this turbulence is terrible, you know, and asking for different altitudes and things. And I came all the way in and I was like, well, I don't know, there was no turbulence where I was at. <laughs> Maybe I was flying in a different section, I don't know. So uh, anyway, this is where you put the fuel in. It does take um, Hunter low lead, standard. The, the tanks actually, so there's kind of a funny story about the, the tanks on this airplane. The tanks hold 115 gallons a side, but there's only 100 gallons of usable. So you actually have 15 gallons of unusable fuel. In the very bottom of the tank, they built what they call slosh boxes, which is actually, you know, for certification, when they were trying to certify the airplane, you know, you have to be able to get into a big bank and it still holds the fuel in there enough to keep the engines running. And so, as they were certifying the airplane, they started out with 15 gallons in the slosh box with the idea that they would continue to do testing and eventually get that down to where it was like five gallons in that, so then you would end up with more usable fuel. But what happened was, is that the, air, the company went out of business before they got all the certification done. So the airplanes that are kind of still out there flying are locked into the original certification standards of how it was done. And so that basically we're, we're lugging around 30 gallons of fuel all the time, of fuel that we really can't calculate or use. Again, I've talked to some of the, the test pilots and whatnot, and they're like, you could probably get that down to five, but I'm not in the business of being a test pilot, so <laughs> always make sure it has plenty of fuel. Uh, we did add JPI, which we'll show you here in a little bit, and so we did set the JPI where it just calculates the 200 gallons, and that's it. There's, there, we, don't even, we don't even notice that that other 30 gallons is in there. So one thing specific about uh, Rutan, pretty much, well, with the Defiant and with the Atom, since those are kind of the only two push poles that I'm fully aware of, is that the, the fuel systems are very simple on them. This airplane, its right wing feeds the rear engine, left wing feeds the front engine. There's no fuel management. There is a crossover if you had the, you know, if you had an engine failure and you wanted to run both, you know, like let's say we had a front engine failure and we were just going to run the rear engine well for fuel balance. We could actually just run the crossover and then that would allow us to burn from both tanks to that engine that's running. But outside of that, when you're flying this airplane, the only fuel management you have is just, you know, lean in your engine when you're there and, and that's it. There's really no, like, I got to switch tanks or any of that. It's just, it's super simple, which is, which is great because it takes, obviously, workload off of you. So the winglet out here. Um, I, again, I, I've referred a lot back to the, the, the guys that designed these wings. There's actually, part of the fuel system is up in this winglet, there's a, there's a fuel vent system that is, is part of venting the tank. So you couldn't just take this winglet off or, or make any modifications to it because there is actual venting inside of the winglet. Uh, I asked the guys, I said, well, you know, like if you're talking about like a 737 or something, they do a lot of the winglet stuff to help fuel efficiency and things like that. So I was talking to some of the guys, uh, the original builders, and, they, and I said, well, does this help with efficiency? And he said, no, it probably makes it worse. <laughs> I was like, all right. But it, there's actually a schematic in the manuals that shows all the fuel venting that, that's built in there. Um, you know, standard static wicks, ailerons. The roll rate on this airplane is, is decent. You can really fly it like a hot rod for as heavy as it is. I've flown a lot heavier airplanes that, that, had, you know, that were worse than this one. Uh, but it, you know, maybe it could have used a little more aileron, but I think overall they did pretty good on the aileron. The ailerons are actually made out of metal versus the carbon fiber, so you can see the rivets and things like that. Ailerons and flaps were made out of metal. I'm not sure what their logic or their thought was. Maybe easier to produce or easier, maybe the FAA put that on them for certification. I'm not sure, you know, because a lot of our experimentals and things that we fly, they're all carbon fiber control services or, comp you know, composite. So. I guess I should have put the flaps down for this, but the flaps are three position flaps. They're all electric. Uh, there's, they, basically they don't have them in degrees in there. They have for takeoff or landing on the flaps. Half flaps is takeoff, full flaps is landing. And that's pretty much the configuration. We don't do a lot of like, you know, one notch of flaps for landing or anything like that. Really doesn't
with the giant tail booms that it would really be bad in crosswinds. And I've been in like up to 30 knot crosswinds and it's just totally, just greases right on. So <coughs> anyway, coming around here to the tail boom, there is, and it would be really neat if, I, if we had time to, to actually take this cover off right here because I've always been fascinated about the weight of the tail of this airplane and the potential for twist in the wing because the tail, you know, it's just carrying so much out there. Well, if you actually take this off here underneath there, there's probably carbon fiber, which is about a half an inch thick. And then there's, there's kind of some bracing in there. And then it actually interlocks to these big, huge bolts right here. And so the combination of that, I guess, and then, you know, with it being a carbon fiber wing, I mean, I, I sometimes I just sit at the back of this airplane and I'm like, why is that wing just not doing all of this because of that weight? Because that's a lot of weight there, you know, but I guess they figured it out. There's a panel right here. As you can see, all these screws come off. We, when we did the very first annual on this, it was kind of like doing exploratory surgery because the, the manuals were there, but they were, they were very limited. So when we did the very first annual, we were like, all right, every single panel is going to come off so we can kind of figure out, like, what are we looking at? You know, we had our A&Ps there and all that. And so we took this panel off, and much to our surprise, there's absolutely nothing underneath it. So. The only thing we can figure is, is that this is like a box for structure and so on the inside up to this point right here it's just perfectly straight up and down and we assume that you know they were just trying to engineer it being more of a box for strength and then they just put this on here as kind of a fairing. So there's actually nothing under there which is surprising. So you do have, so the, and we'll, we'll talk about the elevator we get over here, but all of the the ailerons are actually push rods, so it's all direct drive push rods, and then the elevator is really the only thing that's run with cables, the elevators and the rudders. Uh, but the ailerons themselves are all push pull rods. There's no cables connected to those at all, which gives it that direct, really solid feel when you're flying the airplane, which is, probably helps with some of that, you know, really good uh, sports car feel it has. This is Adam 509 Alpha X-ray. Uh, Adam actually ran to where they were they were basically running all of their airplanes with the with the 500 series so the first one was 501 Alpha X-ray that one uh, some of you may know that was in the Miami Vice movie with Jamie Foxx so if you look real close in that movie you'll see 501 Alpha X-ray uh, so they tried to stay with that I guess they they thought that was cool there may be some that were you know, maybe they ordered a special in number or something like that because there are a few that don't fall in that series. So the way that it worked was you had um, basically serial number one through six were experimental and then seven and beyond were the certified ones. I believe number seven was the first one that was a certified airplane. Mine actually has a unique story that it's the first one of the, and I don't know if this is good or bad or indifferent, but it's the first serial number that Adam got to build on their own without uh, FAA supervision. So, and I forget there's a term for that. I can't remember what the term is, but this, if you go through all the paperwork on this, it's kind of the first one because the first two, like, quote unquote, certified off the line, this, the FAA was right there on top of them watching every step of the way, and then they finally got to the point where they could make their airplane on their own and so this is the first one they did without the FAA looking over their shoulder so that's kind of a neat story uh, if you look at Wikipedia I think it says that there's seven of them built and they're, they're I think that may be the ones that were certified is how they're counting that so I got to be friends with uh, Tony out at Western Skyways and through just conversations discovered because he had some atom parts somebody was like hey Tony's got a bunch of atom parts and so I got to talking to him, and he was telling me one day, he said, if you ever want to see grown men cry, he said, he said, you should have seen the day. He goes, we had to go out to Adam Aircraft after they were shut down. There was two brand new completed airplanes that came off the line, and they had to cut them up with Sawzalls because the FAA made them, I guess it was, they, but they were brand new airplanes. They took the engines and the props off of them. And he said, literally grown men standing there crying, cutting this brand new or just off the line airplane up with Sawzalls. And I don't know all the politics behind it, but it, you know, now that I've owned one, that's just like a super sad thing that those two didn't get to be put out into the public for someone to enjoy. So yeah, 
So anyway, again, the, the, the booms are all carbon fiber. Really everything on the airplane is carbon fiber, you know, minus the flight controls. Uh, your, stand, your standard uh, static port is right here. There's one on each side. The booms are actually built uh, in a jig on their side. And when we get over to the other, well, I'll, just, I'll tell you the story now. We can show you what it is. But they build it on their side, and then they put all the components in there, and then they seal up the boom. You know, they bring in the other half, and they put the two halves together. And I found some really cool old pictures of when it was being in, you know, in production, and some of the guys that worked the line have sent me pictures of different airplanes being built so that I could kind of get my head wrapped around how they were built. But ironically, when they did that, they actually installed the magnetometer when one half of the thing was off. So when we did the avionics, the magnetometer, it literally took us about eight hours to get it out and about another 16 hours to get the new one in because it was so, there was a, there was a beam up inside there and the way it was mounted on the rubber mounts and the way that they did it, they had actually just installed it and then put the other half of the boom over the top of it and didn't really think about the fact that at some point someone may want to replace this component. And so that was a, I mean, we had the most convoluted, we had a screwdriver with tape and a universal joint and all this oddball stuff trying to get up in there to get that out. It was, it was crazy. So anyway, coming along here, uh, this has dual rudders. They are interconnected. You can see that as I, as I move this one, the other one moves with it. Same as that. So they are interconnected. Unlike some of the other Rutan designs, like some of the canards, the rudders are independent of each other. Uh, these are not. These are all interconnected. And again, that's all uh, cable driven. If you come around here, this piece right here is actually uh, very much a required fairing. You can't fly the airplane without this on there. I've, uh, I've heard that the test pilots were telling me that they had to put this on because the yaw control was, was not effective. And so with uh, the guy that came out to kind of fly it with us and, and check us out on the airplane, he said, whatever you do, don't ever even think about flying the airplane with these particular covers off of there because it does affect the aerodynamics that much. So um, anyway. These are just standard inspection ports. There's nothing really inside of this one that I can remember. There's, um, you know, cables and stuff that run through there just for checking cables. Same with this one. And then this, co this cover is just like the one on the other side where you take it off and there's nothing behind it and it's just kind of flat back there. The flaps are kind of a split flap, I guess you could say, because you have one side over here and you have the other side here. We have looked at um, the way, if you can see, kind of this flap is above the fairing. And uh, originally when we, when we got the airplane, we thought, well, maybe this was just misrigged or something like that. And so I got with some of the other owners and it's, it's the way it is. It's just the way they designed it, I guess. But anyway. All right, so going up here to the top, this is, this is my favorite part of the whole airplane, is the scoop. The scoop is actually designed by Continental Motors. Uh, my understanding is that they had actually told Adam that they could not put the Continental engine on the airplane unless they were involved in designing the scoop. And so the scoop is actually super effective. The uh, rear engine actually runs cooler than the front, which is not common on a pusher airplane. Typically, you're, you know, you're always chasing uh, CHT problems on these, but this one runs mid 300s, you know, continuously. If you sit on the ramp, um, it will warm up a little bit. But one of the really neat things about the design of this scoop is, is it's like, let's say for you guys that like to go to Oshkosh, if you're sitting on the ramp for an hour, uh, I know I've been on the ramp at Oshkosh and I've seen canards that have had to shut down because their CHTs are getting too hot, you know, just sitting there. This airplane, you can actually run the front engine up to like 2200 RPM and the airflow from the front engine will actually go into those scoops and cool the rear engine. So it's really kind of neat how it works and, and you don't see a lot of pushers that are designed that well. So uh, coming down here to the bottom of the cowling, you've got on, on this side here, you've just got your, these right here are uh, just overflow when you shut the engine down, you know, your fuel overflows and there's actually a sump here. I won't push that, but that's where you actually check the, you know, the fuel before pre-flight. Right here is the inlet uh, for the air conditioning. It's, it is fully air conditioned. 
doesn't work that great, but it is fully air conditioned. <laughs> on, a, on a hot summer day in Texas, it's, it barely takes the edge off. So, um, And then of course, you're just looking at standard stuff inside of here. On part of the pre-flight, I always check the, you know, just to make sure the exhaust is solid because there has been known failures with exhaust that, you know, you just wiggle them around a little bit, make sure where they come out of the turbo, all that's, all that's good. Um, coming around here, uh, standard Hartzell prop. The, the, the thing about this prop is it was, since it's a pusher, it was specifically designed for the Atom and very, very difficult to find. Um, we have replaced some blades already on these because of the, you know, something a, a mechanic works on the airplane and a bolt goes through the prop and takes a big chunk out of the prop and so we have had to uh, replace this prop here is actually um, only got like two hours on it because this, this was one that I had in stock so I just had to overhaul it and put the whole prop on there because we've got a prop in the back that, you know, a cowling screw or something came off and it took a big chunk out of the blade and it really wasn't a flight worthy problem, but I decided to go ahead and have this one put on there since it's brand new. And this was actually some old stock that I got from Tony out at Western Skyways from all the airplanes that he had to disassemble. So I got to bring that to life a little bit. Uh, this is again, just part of the air conditioning. This is actually the outflow side of it. So it goes in that side, goes through, and then comes out on this side. It's a little dirty. <clears throat> The spinners are specific for the Atom. I do have an extra set of spinners, and every once in a while, I, for some reason, spinners for Atoms pop up on eBay. I don't know why, <laughs> but somebody out there has excess spinners for this airplane. I've never needed a spinner. I've already got two spares, so, you know. Coming around this side, it's pretty much the same as the other side, you know, the scoop design, the flaps, uh, the boom. Now, the inside of this, on the boom is actually the hydraulic pump for the landing gear. So we could, um, I don't know if you could actually get it on the camera, but uh, if we get under here, we'll see if we have a, uh, if I can get a light on there. But seeing that there's a peephole right there. If you go, there you go, that peephole right there. And you look straight down in that peephole and you can see the level of the hydraulic fluid for the, hy you know, for the hydraulic pump. You got to be directly straight on it though or else you don't you won't see it at all uh, that's actually standard equipment again like i said earlier a lot of the parts are interchangeable so like hydraulic pumps things like that are just off the shelf part numbers that you would find elt is in this port right here it's actually tucked way back up in there and it's again hard to get to so i'm not sure what they were thinking on this this is my favorite spot I was telling you all about earlier with the magnetometer is up in here. And so that, that was a big challenge trying to get that out of there. Elevator, as you can see, is so high in the air we can't touch it with our arm. Uh, I can't remember what the dimensions are on how high that is, but I think it's probably 10 feet or so. Um, the elevator is all control dri uh, cables. One of the things that's very interesting about this airplane is it does not have a manual trim. Everything is electric. So if you had an electric trim failure, you would literally just have to uh, muscle the controls. There's no way to manually get it out of whatever trim configuration you're in. Well, I'll show you guys when we get in the cockpit, but there's a uh, bottom button on the yoke, and then you do the trim hat, and that's kind of a safety feature that they do so you don't arbitrarily trim unexpectedly. But all electric trim, no wheels, wheels. I don't know what, if it was because of the boom they had to do that or what, but. So again, on this side, it's just some antennas. You got your rudders, uh, another static port. And walking around here. Again, just another inspection panel. Same scenario on this side where it's just, there's nothing really behind there. Uh, landing gear. And then, I guess just walking around this side. <clears throat> Same thing on this side. The uh, fuel vents are inside the winglet. So it's just a mirror image of the other side. And uh, also the same here with the VGs coming across. So the thing that's kind of neat when we uh, when we upgraded everything from the Avidyne to the Garmin with it being newer, we were actually able to add the Easy Glide system 
from Garmin, which is really just a push button that tells us the nearest airport. Uh, so we'll go over the, the circuit breaker panel here. It's all divided by colors. So as you can see in the red color, you've got the essential bus. And then in blues, you've got your non-essential and then hot battery, which is your fire detect system. And then you've got essentials here in yellow and then non-essentials in green. And that's divided by the engines or the you know front and rear based on the electrical systems. It does have a dual everything in the electrical system. So you've got dual batteries, dual alternators, dual, I mean, so if one system failed, you can actually run the electrical off of the other system. So you have your avionics side, your instrument side, and then you have your forward engine and your aft engine and then kind of your, you know, stall, pedo, those type of things. This does have a, uh, as I was saying a second ago, you've got your bus tie switch here, which connects the front to the rear on the battery. And basically what that is, is if, for example, we, we typically start with the rear engine first. So if I had a low battery on the front, I could start the rear engine, push the cross tie button, and then that would charge the front battery enough to get the engine started. So we'll go ahead and turn on the, the masters here. Wait for everything to power up a little bit. And I'm going to... So you have your two masters, your, your aft and your forward. Again, like I said, you always start with the rear engine first when you can. If you had a reason that the rear engine wouldn't start because of a battery or whatever, you could always start front. But we always like to hear the rear engine running because it's a little bit more of a challenge to hear it running when, we're, when the front engine's running. You have your alternator switches. We don't turn those on until after the engines are running. Load shed is really in the case of an electrical failure. That will actually shed the load down to the minimum items that you need to fly on the on just singular electrical system. We actually upgraded the rear alternator to 100 amp, and so it's a little bit more powerful than the front. So if we had a front failure versus a rear failure, we have more availability on the rear. Okay, so we have our standard uh, ignition switches. Everything is, if it's on the top, it's forward. If it's on the bottom, it's rear. It just kind of flows better that way. So you have your standard uh, start switches, uh, you know, front and rear. These are your high and low fuel pumps. Uh, typically on takeoff, we'll run the low fuel pumps and then above 10,000 feet, we'll run the low fuel pumps. So, uh, and then the avionics master, I'll go ahead and turn that on. This here is what controls the autopilot. So you have a three selector autopilot. You have the off, you have flight director, and then you have the on position. It's a uh, Aztec 55X autopilot, which is really the only thing that we did not change in the avionics package from original. Everything else is new. Uh, when we were looking at all the avionics, we just decided that it was better to keep that because the servos and everything are specific to the airframe. So to try to change it to a Garmin or something would have been too complicated. So it does have the uh, Garmin G600. We couldn't uh, upgrade to the newest touchscreen because it was not on the uh, supplemental type certificate with Garmin. They stopped putting it on there after the G600. So unfortunately, we didn't get to put in the fancy, uh, what is it, the XI that's got the touchscreen and all that. So, but this, this works fantastic. <laughs> Up here is your enunciator panel. Um, as you can kind of see, it's the green lights are just active. Uh, the amber lights are, you know, something that's maybe you need to do, maybe you don't. And then of course, red are all your caution lights. You have a backup airspeed indicator, backup attitude indicator, and then backup altimeter. That's if you had a complete electrical failure and that's the only thing you had to fly on. Those are all um, obviously off of the vacuum system. So we do have the, uh, oops. We do have the GTN 750XI and the 650XI in here, which is, you know, a beautiful system. Obviously, anything Garmin puts out is amazing. And then we have our iPad, which is, we really just run for flight on the iPad. We, uh, so on the original, before we did the avionics, there was actually the uh, engine instruments were here and here. And it was this whole center column was the engine instruments. And so we were able to condense it down and just have the JPI since it does it all on the singular thing. 
And you have, this is actually part of the JPI also. This is part of the certification. They require this. This just gives you, when the engine's running, this gives you your RPMs and your manifold pressure. Just kind of a quick glance to look at, you know, if you, that way you don't have to try to be fumbling around on the JPI to try to see that real quick, especially when you're, as you'll see when we do the takeoff, there's a lot going on in the takeoff, so it's real nice just to be able to look up there and, and see where your manifold pressures and everything are set. Um, as we talked about earlier with the uh, crossover, this is this is the crossover where if you had a, a engine failure, you would you know pull the crossover so that you could have both tanks feeding whatever engine that you're running. This is just an auxiliary uh, music input, and then you've got your alternate static source over there. That would just be if your static source is out on your boom, you know if they froze up or something like that. So, all right, we'll come back down here and. Uh, this is a full electric tram, as I was saying earlier in the video, and the tram actually is on the control yoke. So you have the hat switch here, and on the bottom down here, you can see there's a button. So it's, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, you have to hold that with your pinky, and then you can do the tram according like that. And, but the tram will not work if you're not holding that button. You can see it's kind of placarded over here. And then you have your autopilot disconnect and your uh, control wheel steering for, for your autopilot. All right, these are your trim indicators. Typically on takeoff, we like the trim indicator to be right at the T. That gives us uh, pretty much the right control pressures when we're taking off. The rotor trim we hardly ever use with the, with the dual booms. You just really don't have to use it. So, and you do have the rudder trim left and right here, but again, with the single engine thrust and the dual booms, there's really no, no trim whatsoever required on climb out. It's pretty, pretty much after you take off, it's pretty flat footed on the floor. It's really not much to it. So again, landing gear here, uh, landing gear speed is 147, which this airplane is really hard to slow down. And so typically what I'll do is I'll get it below 147, kind of on the downwind. And then about, uh, and once I get it below 147, rather than putting the gear down, I'll go half flaps because the flap speed is exactly the same as the gear at 147. So I'll go half flaps that way. And, and if I'm on an instrument approach or, you know, procedure turn or anything like that, I'll put in half flaps just to keep my speed down. That way when I get to the final approach fix or I'm turning base to final and I'm ready to put the gear down, then this, the air speed's already where it needs to be. So that's kind of the configuration you'll see today when we fly that when we're coming in, I'll, I'll sometimes even have to pitch nose up to get the thing to slow down. And then once I get below 147, I'll, I'll drop in half flaps and that'll usually keep us below 140 or so with the flaps in there. This airplane does have windshield heat and uh, heated prop. The windshield heat is actually built into the glass. So you, it's got, you know, the controls here that, that warm it up. I've never been in an icing situation, probably never will, because it's not really certified into flown, uh, known icing. It would just be something if you got yourself in an emergency. Uh, pitot heat is there, and then you got your typical standard strobe, nabs, uh, landing, and taxing light. As you can see, here's your, your speeds here. I, I typically, the two main speeds that I look for in this airplane is 147 is kind of that critical speed because a lot happens at 147. And then also 97 knots is kind of where everything happens. That's your rotation speed. So you could really fly this airplane if you just memorize 97 and 147. Those are kind of, don't ever get below 97. And you know, 147 is kind of that magic place where you start doing gears and, and flaps. So. These are just rheostat lights uh, for night. You know, they control the under panel lighting and things like that. So those are just your rheostat. And then there's a day night switch here, you know, to control the, the lighting. Coming over here, this is the pressurization system. It's just a pretty basic standard pressurization. You've got your, uh, and I'm gonna gonna put that there on mix. You've got your bleed air on mix or fresh air. You've got your cabin dump here, the door seal. Uh, you'll see when we're flying that door seal light will run for just a, or when we're taxiing out for just a few seconds and then that lets us know that the, the door is sealed once the light goes out. And then this is just your standard controls for that. Uh, this is where you set your altitude. So in the, in the inside you would set whatever altitude you're going to. So if we're going to go to 17,000 we'd put that there. Uh, and then coming back in for a landing I like to do it 500 foot above the field elevation. So, you know, we, we usually leave it right there because we're, we're usually flying between, you know, we never get above 17 really in this airplane. It says it's certified to 25,000. 
Uh, but in our particular airplane, we, we typically, it, it seems to be the happiest with crews and fuel burn and everything at, at between 16 and 18. That's kind of where it likes to hang out. So, all right. So then we have the JPI. That's really all inclusive of everything. That's got everything you need to see right there. That's, that's new with the upgrades that we did. Uh, it has our manifold pressure prop, CHTs. It has our turbine inlet temperatures. And uh, so that's pretty straightforward, our, our volts and oil pressure, etc. Uh, coming over to this side right here, this is our air conditioner controller. That's how we turn on the air conditioning. And it's super simple. You just hit the button and then control the temperature and the fan. Nothing, nothing real crazy there. And then coming down there, that's just another circuit panel with, you know, some miscellaneous items and things like that. And then all the way at the bottom is the uh, ELT switch. And then I, I guess we went over the yokes we can talk about here. So we've got we've got our, our standard throttle quadrant, you know, our throttles, our props, our mixtures. This does have a friction lock that's over here on this side. Uh, it typically one friction setting seems to hold it. I don't really ever adjust that very much. And then you have your um, alternate air, your forward in induction and your rear on that side over there. And then your fuel shut off valves. If you did have to shut a, an engine down, then you would obviously shut that Pull, you know pull that and shut it down so overhead we've got just standard lighting uh, the plenum actually feeds the air to the back and and then of course the club seating in the back with the uh, four seats in the back and the, it's fully intercom so everybody in the back gets intercom we do have XM radio um, that's about it